Thank you very much for coming here. I hope you find the experience very enriching and enlightening. OK, there will be many, many takeaways. So to start off with, we have this wonderful session from Palo Alto, brought to you by Palo Alto. So essentially, this, the theme of this is all about AI in cyber operations. Okay. And we have with us the expert team from Palo Alto, Sandeep Varian, Ashish, uh, and Tariq. And we have our special guest, Vishal Salvi from Infosys. And he's also on the board of uh, DSEI and uh, quite an expert in the industry. So to set the context, we just want to say that the cost of data breach has been increasing by the year. And 2022 figures say that it was about $4.35 million. And for critical infrastructure, it is $4.82 million. And ransomware, it is $4.54 million. But the reason I bring this up is that it is, we believe, if the things were taken when they ran a survey, $6.2 million per a cost of a breach with AI automation, automation and AI being added into the operations and deployed, it is $3 million lesser, the cost of a cyber breach. And the other thing is that the breach life cycle shrunk from 323 days to 249 days. Another good reason to deploy AI into your cyber operations, okay? So, of course, the few obvious reasons are that the operations worldwide are very under-resourced, under and the complexity is increasing, the sophistication of the attacks is increasing, and waves after waves of new technologies are coming in, for example, 5G, IoT, and so on. So these are adding to the volume and the scale and the complexity. So the supply, the attacks range from everywhere, everything ranging from supply chain to disgruntled employees doing data leaks. So essentially, how does it help? The, how does AI help in running cyber operations? Triage of tier one threats and prediction of future threats, detection of zero day attacks, the reduction of false positives and noise, and of course, correlation of user behavior with threat indicators. These are a few of them. The panel will get into many more. And uh, we have a 15 minutes fireside chat followed by the uh, discussion, the main workshop itself. And then there'll be a 15 minute Q&A at the end. Please feel free to reach out to us at any point in time if you have any questions. So forgot to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Sriram Birudavolu. I head the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, DSCI Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at Hyderabad. Yeah. We are working very closely there locally with many bodies, including the government of Telangana also. We are building a cluster of cybersecurity companies. And we incubate about 30 cybersecurity and privacy startups at Hyderabad. Okay. Please feel free to reach out. And we do all DSCI's programs there, plus our own also. Okay. So please feel free to reach out to us should you have any questions. And Q&A is at the end. And there's a quiz which you should definitely participate in. And I hope you take away a lot from this session. All the best, thank you. So let's start by inviting Sandeep and Vishal to the stage for the fireside chat. Thank you, Dr. Sriram, sir, and uh, very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much being, uh, for being here. Special thanks to Vishal. Uh, thank you so much for being here for this workshop. I think it's great to connect with you once again. Uh, so I think a quick intro of Vishal. I'm sure all of you know Vishal uh, very well. Uh, as, as Sriram, sir, introduced, uh, Vishal, Vishal Salvi is a CISO for Infosys. Uh, he's a veteran in the industry. He's, he's a pretty well-known figure in the market. And uh, I'm sure he, he was also working for, as a CISO of HDFC Bank earlier. Right, I think he's a pretty well-known figure in the market now. 
so I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sandeep Variam. I'm, I'm, I'm Cyber Security Advisor with Palo Alto Networks. I've been here for the last seven years working in this, uh, with, with the organization. Uh, so, Shal, once again, thank you. So again, as the team said, we have 10 to 15 minutes. I just want to have quick thoughts from you, what, what you think through a couple of topics. Since our topics is more on the SOC side, and it's more on the AI-driven uh, kind of a SOC is what we're currently looking at. So my first question to you, Vishal, is uh, today if you look at most of the SOC are getting into an autonomous nature. I think a lot of organizations are looking at a perspective that we need to be much more autonomous. The SOC can be much more autonomous in nature. So what would be your guidance based on your experiences so far? What would be your guidance in terms of the best practices what companies should take, or organizations should take, especially when you're moving towards an autonomous world? So good morning to all of you, and thank you, Sandeep. It's good to meet you after a very long time. And uh, I think, you know, if you look at it in terms of the, uh, the question itself, you know, for Infosys, we have gone through multiple rounds of transformation as far as SOC is concerned. One of the things that I used to say in, um, in the early stages of my stint at Infosys was, you know, the SOC is where uh, the heart is, right? of the body, you know, when you talk about cybersecurity operations, because that really keeps pumping the blood and helps you to really look at what's happening in your organization, right? So it, it becomes a center of everything. And, uh, you know, and, and I come from those days when we used to do, uh, you know, actual printouts of firewall logs and people used to manually review them. And that was the first SOC, if you like to call it that way. And then where we are today, so we've gone through multiple set of transformation per se, but if you look at specifically for Infosys, one of the challenge that we had was a really uh, a humongous amount of logs and a very complex infrastructure. And, and you want to have a very sentient uh, kind of a SOC, right, which is able to collect all the important elements or events which are happening all over your network. And then try to make sense out of it in terms of writing the right use cases and um, playbooks so that you can actually do some action around that. And, and the third thing is about how do you make sure it is relevant and kept current, right? So we spend a lot of time in terms of becoming deeply intimate with all the use cases. We actually started creating workbooks for each use case and writing the whole uh, history of why the use case was created, what is the false positive rate, you know, what is the a false negative rate and all of that. And and therefore, looking at, you know, in terms of which are the use cases which are firing, which are the use cases which are not firing, should we retire them, and what needs to be added more, and so on and so forth. So it has to be a more of a live kind of an enterprise SOC, right? You cannot have something which is just created and you keep running. It has to be constant endeavor to change. Now, in all of these things, the most important aspect is in terms of how do you use the human cognitive mind to focus on you know the 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 thinking part right and how do you reduce the burden from the human mind to remove the the stuff which does not require require your brain power right the the things which can be automated and so the automation and autonomous sock becomes a very important element of the modern sock in fact i would go to the extent of saying that if you really want an effective uh, and credible SOC operations, it has to be deeply autonomous. Because the moment you put humans to do that activity, you will actually always have errors. And you can never remove errors from it. And humans are too slow to respond to today's cyber threats. right? So that's the context I would paint. And then I think within that, you know, once you've sort of decided on that, then it, it's about really, you know, putting the right technology and the right strategy and the right approach and the right teams to then focus on building and engineering that solution to remain autonomous. And I can talk about, for example, we have done 100% automation for our L1, right? Which was unthinkable just five years back. It, if somebody had told me that you will do a full automation of your L1 resources, I would have not believed it, but today it's possible. We've done 70% of automation of our L2 activities through automation. And that's when we are able to now redeploy the manpower 
in focusing on content management, focusing on use cases, triaging, and you know, then threat hunting. So that's really how the, the, there's a shift which is happening in terms of the previous generation of SOC and how you look at modern SOC operations. Thank you, Vishal, for that uh, detailed explanation. Couple of things, uh, just I want to ask you on the same note. Uh, so I, I also feel that the, the SOC maturity curve matters a lot, so especially with Infosys environment, you are, you are running a very, very mature SOC. But f from an organization's point of view, what, what is your uh, uh, thought process to them? So do we need to reach that particular maturity curve before we th think about working on an autonomous SOC? Or because from a SOC point, as you rightly pointed out, the Andres is facing through a lot of problems in terms of alerts. How do we manage these alerts? How do we prioritize what is the best one required? So how do, where do you reach that maturity curve to, so that we can start thinking about a much more autonomous SOC? So clearly, there is a approach and maturity model for any SOC operations, right? Yeah. You, you can pick up any security activity, cybersecurity activity, and you can build a maturity model on that. And SOC definitely has one. The way I would say is that you know the the it depends on how much committed and how much investments you are doing in your SOC. Your the response will actually depend on that. Yeah. So, for example, you have limited amount of investments, then you would want to go in a very calibrated manner, and and drive the change so that it is you know uh, congruent with the amount of investments that you want to do. You could also look at if if you know that SOC and modern SOC operations is very critical for your business needs, then you can actually do a step change and do a more of a greenfield transformation approach yeah. and overhaul that uh, so that you are able to sort of, you know, uh, build uh, the modern SOC. But for that to happen, it's not just about investment in tech because you need that human capital and you need that brain power to really run that machine, right? It is a... It is, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I won't call it it's rocket science, but at the same time, it's not a trivial thing. You know, you need to have the right people with the right mindset who understand what it means to work on understanding the use cases and playbooks and how to then drive and collect the data from various data sources and how do you write the playbooks which will help you to do that. So I would say, you would have to have a balanced level of investments in terms of the tech as well as the people who, who will then drive it. And what I've seen is that it's not about just hiring a bunch of people and asking them to do what you need to do. You need to build a team which understands this as a culture. Yeah, true. And, and culture takes time, right? Even SOC requires the right mindset and a culture to be really effective. And so the teams need to know what their play is, how they collaborate with each other, how do, what are their roles, and, and then how do they test, uh, because there is uh, a threat intelligence team, uh, there is a threat hunting team, there is a content management team, and then there is an ops team, and there is an incident response team, right? Uh, and all of them need to know their roles. Uh, and like I said, you know, while L1, L2 is automated, but the way we define L1 and L2 now is very different from what we used to define it maybe a few years earlier. So you need to have that hierarchy of who's that L1, who's that L2, and who's that L3. And as we start looking at it, and all these parameters that I'm talking about really help you to build a maturity model yeah. for a SOC. Yeah. So that's really how you can sort of decide. But so it's all about, you know, what is your organization context? What is your investment ability and commitment towards building a SOC operations. And then third is then based on that you select the right strategy. I believe that the need to have a SOC as a formality is just not going to work Correct. anymore. Yeah. If you want to have a SOC, you need to be fully deeply committed towards making all the things required for you to have some chance of doing what the SOC is supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks. Thanks, Vishal, for that. So I'll move to my second question to you. Um, so if you look at, again, what every large organization like yourself, and I think um, every verticals for that matter, in the last two to three years of time, if you look at the, our threat landscape is very, very large. The, I would say the perimeter is no more there, as we, as we know. The threat landscape is very large. The attack surface is very large. So how, how does organizations look like? For example, let's say when you hear about those modern day threats, 
Uh, these are most of the things are unknown level attacks what we're seeing. Uh, uh, let's keep apart the situations, whatever we are going through. But however, if you look at those modern day threats, how does or how does uh, an organization be prepared themselves? The team should be prepared themselves so that we can prevent any kind of a modern day threats. So what's your take on that, Isha? See, for a la large part of my career in cybersecurity, uh, more than two decades now, I always thought that this was like a hopeless job, right? And uh, the, s the stacks were so much against you that somebody will always come and breach you. That, that's always, that's the only thing which I thought because it was such a difficult uh, problem to solve, right? And it's, there are so many things to handle and you have to just, you have to be right always and all the time and uh, threat actors have to be right only once, right? So I, I always thought that, you know, it was definitely, um, you know, the stacks were against you. But, you know, having, having worked with a very motivated and highly passionate team and, you know, with a lot, lot of support from leadership, management and investments, I, I do believe that if you uh, have the right strategy, if you right, have the right investment and you have the right commitment and you have the right team and passion around that, this problem can be solved. In, in the sense that you can always uh, be able to sleep comfortably at night, yeah. okay? And, and the only way to sort of do that is to have extreme paranoia about your job. You should be never, you should never be comfortable. The moment you get comfortable, that's the end of your, because you know, you'll, you will stop innovating, you'll stop doing new things. So it has to be a positive paranoia, not a negative energy paranoia, so that you're, you're saying that, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to be ahead of the curve in terms of what are the threat patterns, what's happening around the network, and how do I ensure that I am writing the necessary use cases so that I'm protecting my organization. Now, but that's the mindset. But then, you know, having the right mindset, having the right strategy is one aspect of it. But without an execution plan in place and without ability to govern and execute, it's of no use, right? It will remain on a paper, but you'll never be able to then achieve what your goals are. So execution is extremely important. And, and over there, it's about, I, I talked about culture, right? So building a culture in the organization saying that, how do you respond to the various threats? And how do you make sure all aspects are covered? So for example, in our SOC, we would have anything between 450 to 500 use cases. And we're constantly living them, constantly changing them, constantly measuring the output, and, and looking at what's happening around the world and adding those, you know, it's, see, security is about, if you look at it in a very simplistic term, security is all about knowing the patient zero and getting your organization immune to that threat, right? Protecting yourself against zero days, if it's a targeted attack, is, is uh, requires a completely different level of maturity, right? Very few organizations can really manage to survive that. But you remember that there will always be that patient zero and there's a good chance that you will not be that, right? Uh, so the question is, the moment I understand that there is a patient zero somewhere in the world, and today it's a hyper-connected world, so it's not very difficult for us to really know what's happened to somebody else and quickly immunize your organization. So SOC is all about really having that situational awareness about what's happening, prioritizing the threats which are most critical, and then remediating that. I also believe that one... So when we talk about our strategy for cybersecurity, we're, not, we're just not talking about MDR. We're talking about MPDR. And what it means is that protection is equally important as much as detection, and they should go hand in glove with each other. So in my mind, vulnerability management has moved to the SOC already. They cannot be sitting somewhere out and doing something on their own, and the, the defense team is working on their own in their own silos. They need to work together, because only then you can prioritize what's happening to your network. So if there is an active vulnerability and if there is an exploit in the wild which is exploiting that vulnerability, that is something which I need to first prioritize yeah. as remediation. True. So, I mean, I can go on, I can talk about this for another two hours and we'll still have a lot of things to talk <laughs> about. But broadly, this is, this is the, if you have this mindset and approach towards SOC operations, then I think you can sleep better, you know, sleep well at night. Nice, nice. So Vishal sp uh, spoke about paranoia. I think he's one of the coolest CISOs which I've worked with. So <laughs> he's still being one of the coolest CISOs. <laughs>
Uh, okay, Vishal. Uh, so I, I think on that note, one, one more topic on that, or one more point on that. Uh, I feel uh, visibility plays a very critical role, especially very large enterprises, since, as you rightly pointed out, the large user base, the kind of applications of what you have. I think visibility across an enterprise, where, let's say, if I can connect the dots between what happened with my work from home scenario, or what happened in my cloud environment, what happened in my endpoint or my critical server farms, if I can do some level of stitching between the data points, I'm sure SOC will become much more proactive, right? Do you agree with that, Michelle? No, it's just not SOC, right? Yeah. Any 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 exactly. work that you do in IT and cybersecurity, it starts with knowing how what kind of infrastructure you Absolutely, have, right? Yeah. And it's so funny because see, we done a global CISO forum panel, right? And uh, one of the things that uh, one theme that we had was about you know uh, technology discovery and understanding about uh, your IT asset. And everybody seems to have that problem, and we seems to have still not solved the problem, right? So, uh, and one one reason we have not solved it is because we wanted IT to solve this problem, and somehow we said that CMD we should solve the problem, and CMD we never was complete, and we kept on waiting, and we kept on externalizing that problem, saying IT has not solved it. That's why we are where we are. Why should you do that? You solve your own problem, figure out a way to understand what is required to know what your estate is, why depend on IT, you did run your own tools, you have now so many sensors, you have so many technologies, so many tools deployed, collect all that information, triage it together and understand what your assets are. So uh, I think you need to just take the bull by its horn and yeah. you know, take, take ownership of resolving this issue and don't, do, don't externalize on IT and CMDB because CMDB is solving some other problem and, and get hold on what your asset is. Once you have that, suddenly, you know, you, you start feeling that, yes, I, I know, you know, what, what my estate is, and then the next step is about looking at the vulnerabilities and what's happening on them, and then, of course, you know, you need to do what you need to do. Yeah, thanks, Vishal. I'll take two more minutes before we wind up the five-side chat. My last question to you, Vishal, I think we have been hearing AI a lot especially I would say uh, late uh, December 2022 or late November 2022 onwards, we have been hearing chat GPTs of the world. AI is very common, it's a buzzword everywhere. So what is your take? I know there are many, many use cases what you can solve. So I'll just keep the SOC apart for the, aside for the time being. But what will be your thoughts in the sense, how will organizations will start consuming AI? It's already there, but how will they start consuming AI in a much more larger way? See, there are actually three, three broad elements to how we should look at AI uh, from a you know cybersecurity perspective, right? I think the first aspect of AI is in terms of how it it it's going to be adopted by business businesses, right? And there is clearly going to be a big gold rush, mad rush on how you know business is going to adopt AI, and the cybersecurity fraternity needs to really define and calibrate the right policies and the right uh, approaches towards uh, you know building a right policy towards ai now we know that global financial organizations you know this is a fintech event have blocked chat gpt yeah. and the reason they have blocked chat gpt is because uh, there is no control over how you uh, you know how your queries and how your code is going to get uh, generated i'm we are worried you know from an infosys point of view we don't want our employees to put uh, confidential and IP uh, data or a code onto chat GPT where we will we will compromise uh, our information so so I think the first element of defining the right strategy and policy and as is the case in any innovation any change which happens in the world we will go through a, a state of confusion a state of uh, lack of control and lack of clarity before we will evolve and uh, and the policies will stabilize and will get enforced right so that's number one the second element is in terms of how you are going to deploy AI uh, and use it for cybersecurity. And as is the case in any innovation, you know, we, we talk about major changes like cloud adoption, and cloud played a very significant role in terms of how cybersecurity architecture has transformed from what it was on-prem to what it is now uh, cloud-enabled. And we have been able to significantly make leapfrog changes in terms of our ability to sense, because security is all about being sentient. And with cloud, we are able to really orchestrate and govern uh, like never before, right? 
and, and we talk about SASE, we talk about you know uh, EDR, XDR, all of that is possible because of cloud. So every every change that has happened in technology has helped cybersecurity to leapfrog itself, and AI is no no different. It will it will help us to leapfrog further. We've always struggled in terms of articulation, orchestration, threat hunting, and we've always looked at, you know, how do we have elastic data? How do you have elastic search? How do we scale, uh, you know, through the complexity? And how do you really do effective threat hunting? I mean, if I just take a small detour and give you an example, every incident that has happened in the world, after two months, we are able to decipher everything that happened. Yeah. But why does it need to be two months to, for you to know exactly what happened. Why can't it be done proactively in real time so that we don't allow that incident to happen in first place? AI technology has the possibility to help us to go there, yeah. right? So in, in my mind, uh, in, there are many examples where we will adopt this new tech to help us get better in terms of how we manage cybersecurity tooling and architecture and, you know, and also automation, right? So that's the second part. And the third part is the scary part, right? Where, you know, the adversaries and the uh, threat actors are going to use CMA AI yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to <laughs> you know, attack. orchestrate their attacks and, you know. So that is, uh, you know, just like, for example, ransomware, right? Who would have thought that encryption will be used against the cybersecurity world? But it is actually used and it became such a big problem and it is still such a big problem where encryption is used to encrypt the data and it becomes a ransomware, right? So our own weapon is actually used against us. So, um, so the same thing can you know, happen for AI as well. So I think you need to keep a watch on all these three things. You have to cut the clutter and look at the most important thing that will happen eventually. Uh, but my sense is that it will have a profound impact in terms of how we look at cybersecurity in the next uh, 18 months to two years time. Yeah. Thank you, Vishal, once again. Thanks. Lovely talking to you. So I request you to join the workshop post this. And thanks once again. I think from with this, I'll introduce my team members, Mr. Ashish and team to take over for the workshops. Vishal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Bye. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for you know spending time today. My name is Ashish Tarke. I'm a cybersecurity solutions architect at Palo Alto Networks. I think the stage has been set today, right? Uh, we have had an excellent discussion on where we are, what we are seeing in terms of trends uh, in security operations. Uh, so, I'll not spend a lot of time in context, right? I, I'll actually jump to uh, the action, but I just want to kind of uh, reiterate a few points uh, that you know uh, Dr. Sridharan said, Mr. Vishal said around uh, security operations. Right, uh, we're f uh, indeed facing a deluge. A if I, I can get on the screen, please. Please on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So while they set set it up, right? So a uh, couple of things, right? That I, I think. Uh, very interesting to note, right? Uh, incidents have been increasing, right? SOCs have been uh, have been required to scale up when you talk of incidents. One of the biggest reasons for that is the way that we have transformed uh, our own architectures itself, right? Applications have changed completely. The use of cloud services, microservices, right? That has completely changed the defender's perspective. Now, there are more services that they need to protect. There are more services that are internet-facing as well that, uh, that have, a, I would say, a, high need of being protected. They, they are mission critical as well to the organization, right? So that means that, you know, everybody is, is on the money. They need to ensure that there is no outage, there is no, uh, no security incident because now there is a wide reaching impact, right? So, uh, but, but the, often the problem that we see is, you know, uh, this, this is something that I, uh, interesting I saw on LinkedIn was a lot of times what happens is when ransomware incidents happen, the first thing that happens is the, the SOC gets blamed. You know, you, you fail to detect and respond. Right? Unfortunately, that's not true, right? Because the SOC has to deal with a lot of feeds coming from various sources. They have to make sense of that data, right? 
uh, unfortunately what happens today is that uh, the SOC operations, the reality of SOC operations is very complex. A lot of times the SOC doesn't really own the devices, doesn't really own the applications where they need to take responsive actions, right? Uh, there are multiple chains in reporting. Uh, there are, uh, for example, they'll have to jump through multiple hoops to just perform certain detective tasks and then take approvals to perform responsive tasks as well, right? Now, this, all of this really builds into the whole mean time to respond and mean time to resolve for an incident, right? And what we have done is when new things have come up, right? For example, we started off saying we need to co collect logs at a central place. We started off with SIM architectures. And then we said, you know, the SOC needs a visibility into live instance at the end point. We had EDR and so on and so forth, right? Identity, we had UBA, we had, uh, uh, with th for aggregating thread fields, we have TIP. But the problem that happens for the SOC is that these are still different tools, right? Now, with different tools, there are, they have their own challenges in terms of each of them is a different data silo, different management console. A lot of time of the SOC engineer is spent on maintaining these tools. Uh, the, the SOC engineer is basically responsible for ensuring upkeep of these particular tools. They are responsible for ensuring that, you know, the data that is being collected, is, it, is, it is making sense and correlate that, right? Now, each of this is its own data silo. Each of them logs in different ways. And now it's up to the SOC engineer to make sense out of it, right? Now, when we, when we kind of step back, what ultimately, what you've built is an integration piece, right? And then uh, when the SOC engineer realizes that, you know, I've started from the ground up and I, I've kind of built this whole integrated architecture that if one change, something would change, right? Uh, let's say, you know, for example, I have an integrated uh, device. Version change, the integration breaks. Now the SOC engine's time is spent into kind of ensuring that it gets to work, right? So that is where I think we have to look at how do we think radically around solving this problem, right? How do we make our engineers much more proactive that they focus their quality time as we, we, as we saw in the previous session, as how we, they focus their quality time on detection and response rather than maintaining the tools that, or the tooling around the SOC. How do we make the security operation much more automation, right? Uh, today, if you look at on the left-hand side, right, today it is more primarily the SOC is analyst driven, right? The analyst goes through the incident and then decides, for example, what are the actions or the activities that need to take on. Based on that, they would decide, for example, if there's certain automation pieces that need to be done, so maybe isolating an endpoint or maybe killing a particular process, right? Those are analyst driven actions. This unfortunately will not scale. Uh, human capital is limited. We have a dearth of cybersecurity professionals as well. And if from in a SOC's perspective, we also need to ensure that, you know, every action, every, every playbook is repeatable as well in the same exact fashion. The same, and any incident that comes into the SOC, right, the actions have to be repeatable. So this is where we need to look at how do we make this model flipped? We have an automation first SOC, right, where automation is the pillar. A lot of the, or you would say the repeatable incidents, the common incidents that uh, typically so SOC spend a lot of time on can be automated out, right? Uh, those are automatically handled and then quality data or quality investigations where the analyst can add value, where they need to be able to, you know, inspect in and add business value is where, you know, what we need to look at, right? Uh, now, one very important thing in this particular piece, right? While we can add tools, we can add AI, we can add piece, right? Uh, business context is something that the analyst has to drive into, into the investigation, right? Business context is something that is very specific to the organization. Uh, a very simple example could be, you know, uh, if there's a malware, go ahead and uh, isolate that. That would be a standard playbook. But then is that particular application business critical, mission critical, right? Then there would be some uh, differing actions that we might take based on the business context. That is something that the analyst brings to the table here. So we flip the chart, we ensure that automation is the key aspect that we want to look at. So first piece, data multiple sources of data. It could be endpoint, it could be the network, it could be identity, it could be cloud, right? Applications, microservices, etc. We need to bring that all together. If data is siloed, if data is separated out, it will take a long time to bring context. And that is what we are struggling with, right? So what we want to ensure is bring that data together, stitch it together, get a rich context to the security operations analyst. Once data is stitched together, we leverage AI and machine learning to derive context around it. 
and enhance and superpower the investigation. This is where the, uh, if, for example, if we are able to extract the key items from that particular uh, investigation or that particular stitched alert, we can quickly tell, uh, tell the security analyst that these are your actionables, right? And the security analyst drives the actionables themselves. Uh, this ensures that, you know, in this particular model, our mean time to respond, mean time to detect gets lowered down. Now, this is where we have, uh, we've introduced the platform called Cortex-XEAM. Uh, Cortex-XIAM is, a, 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 was a radical thinking from Palo Alto to ensure, you know, that how do you build a platform that is autonomous driven, right? That is ensuring that uh, any security incidents are automatically driven by the SOC. Uh, it is an automation first architecture, right? Uh, we started off on this journey when we, we introduced XDR to the world, right? So with XDR, the first thing that we wanted to look at was how do we aim the security team with best in class detection? A lot of times what happens is the security team is playing with second hand data. What is second hand data? Uh, this is data that is collected by network devices or devices that are not in control of the SOC. Now there needs to be a validator that the SOC needs to have, right? That is, that is the first piece. That is where XDR came in, right? Trying to stitch in data from various sources and give first hand info to the SOC. Uh, so XIM is built on the same platform of uh, adding de detection response and then supercharging that with automation. The first thing and the foundation of this is data, right? Uh, with data, right, the, the whole point is if, if there's garbage in, gar uh, then there's garbage out, right? Any amount of AI, any amount of UI, it will not be any good if there's no quality data that's been collected. So that is the first focus. How are we collecting data? How are we stitching data into the investigation? Uh, uh, with XIM, what we do is we ensure that the data that we collect, right, is collected across various sources. Uh, collect, taking that data source, we stitch that data. Stitching is, beyond correlation. What do you mean by stitching? It's taking that data, mapping out key aspects within different sources, be it the network, be it the endpoint, and stitch them together to see that, whether that is part of the same security incident, right? Whether there are, uh, you know, uh, whether there's a threat actor who is very advanced, he is coming into the network, he's performing lateral movement within the network, and then there are, there are certain actions that they're taking up. Now, typically when you think of this, what happens is the, uh, the, the security analyst basically has, is seeing different alerts from different devices. There's one from the network that says, maybe there's a vulnerability that's been exploited. There's one from uh, the endpoint or the EDR that says, you know, this, this is a process injection that is happening. Different alerts that they have to make sense and understand whether it's part of the same campaign, right? And this is where data stitching really helps. It brings together all of these disparate silos of data into one single visualization. Uh, so for the SOC analyst, it becomes very clear, how is this particular incident originated? What all things are affected? What are the attack paths, right? Where has that particular incident moved to, right? They have all of that, that visualization right at hand, which means that they can quickly pivot down on, uh, you know, the affected entities. They can quickly pivot down on what are the actionables that they need to derive up, right? So that is the first piece. Without data stitching, it becomes very difficult for the SOC team to, you know, really uh, collect all that data. So what happens is they have to go through various consoles, you have to go through various tooling to make sense out of it, what is, what is really the, the problem, right? The next piece, and this is where AI uh, would really play a very big role. I think we, uh, Dr. Sriram talked about the huge deletion of incidents and where we need to have better prioritization as well, right? Uh, as a SOC team, what is happening is the number of alerts that are coming inside the SOC. Now, because of this number of alerts, what usually happens is there's a struggle in how we are saying what needs to be prioritized, what needs to be handled first. I, almost uh, every SOC team that we speak to about, right, they say it's almost like finding the needle in the haystack. There are a lot of, uh, lot of typical alerts and then you have to find that one critical alert where, where the attacker can really get in. And that is what uh, XIM really looks at solving. We apply more than 1,000 plus AI models to understand uh, what is that particular incident about, right? Uh, now, uh, this is something we call a smart score. Smart score basically looks at what are the parts of that particular incident, right? Uh, smart score has something called as explainability that talks about you know, how many hosts are affected, what all things have been uh, executed as part of the attacker, right? It, it could also look at is this part of a sustained attack campaign or have you seen this before, right? So all of that explainability is added as part of smart score. So it's not just an arbitrary high severity, critical severity that is SOC sees. They actually see the reasoning why the AI has recommended that this is an this is an incident that you need to prioritize as part of your incident handling procedure, right? So. The, uh, the analyst might see 
thousands of incidents in there uh, as part of that, uh, that dashboard, but this is the specific incident that you need to focus on. That is very crucial. Now, how are we really, you know, how are we really confident that this, this works, right? Uh, Palo Alto Network sees more than, you know, 750 million objects uh, uh, on a single day, right? There's 1.5 million attacks, uh, uh, unique attacks that we see in, in a single day as well, right? Based on that, we build our learning models that understand and identify, you know, these particular attack patterns and behaviors in, in incidents. Using that, we derive the smart scoring technology. Now, apart from smart score, that is AI driven and helps understand the network effect of things that are happening beyond your organization, the analyst or the SOC management team can also add business context to that. So we have smart ruling rules that can add business level context that say, you know, for a particular incident or particular event, this is, this is a business context that this is a mission critical application, new to prioritize this further, right? So adding business context to the smart scoring as well. Now, the incident is prioritized, uh, there are some IOCs or IOAs that have been identified and typically the SOC is also getting multiple regulatory intel, there are threat feeds that the SOC subscribes to, how do we tie that together to incident, right? Rather than the analyst going in and uh, identifying, for example, these are the IOCs, these are, these are known and trying to do a manual correlation, how can we automate that? That is the first piece, right? So we tie in TIA right inside the incident and extract and identify, okay, these are known, these are been identified by multiple feeds that you are receiving and what is the confidence level of these particular feeds. We can normalize that particular score as well uh, and, and based on that give a confidence to the analyst that the action that they're taking is, is uh, concrete. The other piece around that is uh, a lot of times you could have that particular threat actor within your organization as well that has, uh, you know, tried to, uh, uh, has been part of an incident that was previously identified, right? What we can also do is because we have this this data lake that is, has collected all the security incidents of the past, what we can actually do is we can map out and identify related incidents as well. We can go back in time and understand that this particular uh, threat actor that I have received an intel for now, has he been part of my environment? Have, have we seen that as part of a sustained campaign in my previous security incidents? That is very crucial as well for any modern day SOC because uh, we have seen a lot of sustained campaigns that take place over months at a time. Right, threat actors who start off low and slow that perform actions, uh, you know, one at a time across, across spread across weeks, right? That can be very difficult to identify. So, uh, mapping related incidents, very crucial, that ultimately helps the, uh, the security team to identify that this is a high profile campaign that is very sustained against me and that, that, that is what I need to target at. Uh, we spoke of automation first as well, right? So, XIM has automation built as part of its core construct. Uh, any incident that is detected by XIM automatically has, uh, detects what are the automation playbooks that can be run against it, right? So playbook first, automation first, it will derive the actions, it will derive the, the uh, incident actions based on, on the incident type that is there, right? We'll run through a demo as well, but a uh, couple of things that I want to identify, right? Uh, if you look at here on the on the right hand side, uh, there are data sources that the incident is mapping out towards. There could be multiple quality data sets that we are looking at. It could be the endpoint, it could be the network, it could also be, uh, uh, you know, maybe a vulnerability management system as well, right? All of these together combine and make, uh, uh, build out the attack story. Once the attack story has been built, they identify what is the incident type and what are the automations that can be done. You are not doing automation or actions at just one, one uh, device, right? There could be actions needed across different uh, devices. There could be actions needed across uh, different data sources as well. It could be, for example, I need to block an IP at the network firewall. It could be I need to, uh, you know, disable a particular user at the Active Directory. These are different automations that we, uh, that might be needed as part of an incident response. And that is what automatically attaches as part of the play, uh, as part of the incident. Uh, it will derive it based on the MITRE attack context that these are the actions that have been taken by the adversary and uh, these, these can be automated. Uh, in some, uh, uh, for example, in, as part of your process, you might not want 100% automation as well, right? You might want certain behavioral approvals before the, uh, the, uh, the tool basically takes action uh, on the device itself, right? So this is where what we can, uh, we can actually as, have as part of the workflow is an approval process that goes to maybe the SOC manager or the business unit owner, for example, provides a survey and then, and then the action can be taken. Right, so we can have workflow-based automation as, as well uh, as part of it. The third piece around here is playbook recommendation as well, 
right? Now, uh, as part of the invest incident investigation, the analyst might want to do further deep dives into that particular incident, right? They might want to perf perform certain actions. Uh, uh, as an example could be, there's a file that has been detected as part of that, uh, that incident. The analyst wants to, you know, typically wants to run that file on a sandbox, extract IOCs out of it, extract IOs out of it, and then, you know, uh, put those into blocking mode. So that's a typical action that they do, right? Now, what we can do is we, we can learn these kind of actions that the analyst typically runs. We have playbooks built that we recommend can, could, be, could be run against this incident by the analyst. And if the analyst is running them again and again, we can, auto, we can offer the analyst to say that, you know, we can just add this to your normal automation workflow. You don't need to run this again and again, right? It, it can be completely automated in that particular piece as well. Uh, the last piece is uh, around the analyst actions for a particular process, right? So, for example, if an analyst is performing certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, device level actions, we have hot buttons available for the analyst that they can go ahead and uh, perform that action directly, right? They don't need to log into the device, they don't need to uh, reach out to the team, they can actually perform uh, direct actions as required right on the platform itself. The uh, the other important piece is adding identity. How do we add, add identity and provide much more granular incident context around, around threats, right? Because often what happens is uh, uh, there is a device, there's a user that's operating on the device. Uh, when there is a cyber incident, the context is completely different, right? The user is deviating from that particular behavior. Uh, what XIM does is it profiles all of the identity context within the organization. It will identify all of the users and their typical behavioral patterns, right? Uh, the entity is within that particular organization and understand and build uh, relationship charts around how is that particular identity performing, right? How is, what are the typical actions that they take? Using that, the SOC analyst can view the user scorecard for a particular incident, right? I'm observing large FTP uploads on a, from a particular system. Is that typical behavior for that particular user? Is this business function requiring him to do that? That is something that can be validated using identity. Otherwise, what would happen is it could be a business process. Maybe the user has changed systems for a day or so, but because, uh, but because it was uh, observed that this is unusual on, on that particular system, uh, the SOC analyst went ahead and blocked it, right? So adding identity really helps in understanding uh, such context. Now, uh, one particular context is, you know, you see a lot of logins from users uh, uh, typically it could be VPN logins, for example, right? Now, uh, where is the user logging in from? Is it unusual for him? But so typically what we can, uh, what this can help you understand is what is the normal for the user? What is the normal baseline for the user, right? Understanding what is normal can help un uh, uncover what is abnormal. So in this particular case, behavioral analytics has identified that that particular user typically logs in from four different uh, typical countries, right? Yeah, logs in from India, logs in from England, but then for one specific incident, there's a login coming in from Kuwait, right? Unusual. Whereas if if uh, if the uh, if you look at the normal incident vulnerability, or we could say look at the incident severity level, it would have been a medium. But adding identity on top of that incident, it helps understand that okay, this is sub something which is abnormal for the user, and this needs to be taken into context of what is happening really as, as for, uh, part of for this particular user, right? Uh, Last piece is around, you know, we, we have heard a lot of talk around generative AI and chat GPT, right? It's been part of the buzzwords uh, recently. So XIM can also be, uh, you know, uh, extended. We can integrate with different data sources. We can integrate with different tools and perform additional outcomes as well. Uh, one such uh, integration is with chat GPT. Uh, so one of the use cases that can actually be leveraged is, you know, creating incident reports. You talk to any SOC personnel, Creating reports after the investigation is something that most people hate. Creating documentation around it, right? Uh, and making it explainable as well. Most people are much more technical in nature. They write technical reports, uh, technical jargons, but something that, that might not be, you know, explainable to, to, uh, to an exec, right? So uh, we, we have kind of uh, created this particular integration that can create this, uh, uh, create a generative report based on explainability of, uh, of that particular incident. So it uh, identifies specific aspects of that particular in incident, extracts that, and extracting those in, uh, those uh, incident timelines, we can we can kind of build out this particular report for uh, Silver execs. This is just one example. Uh, obviously, you need to uh, kind of use this with uh, uh, with a pinch of salt in considering you know we were not sending critical data, you're not sending organizational data uh, out to uh, to a unknown third party or entity, right? But this is available. You can actually con configure and modify specific, uh, you know, 
specific tags or specific type of data types that you want to share with, through ChatGPT. So, uh, in a nutshell, XIM is what we envision as the big transformation for soft teams, right? Bringing together multiple data silos, multiple tools into one single security platform. A security platform that detects, investigates, and protects at, as the first layer. A security platform that is automation first and helps transform your workflows for, for the SOC and automate that. A security platform that identifies all of your unknown assets and brings them into the known so that the SOC team can look at securing that, right? Uh, this is a bit of a proof from Palo Alto Networks as well. We started adopting this own platform in-house first, right? Because we want to look at, we step in the shoes of, of a customer itself. Our SOC, a uh, couple of years back, we had multiple days of, you know, uh, MDTR. Uh, once we started adopting SIAM, we saw its benefits ourselves. That is where we decided to consumerize the practical platform. We see 36 billion events in a single day. We have one of the largest cybersecurity companies in the globe and also one of the largest prime targets as well. Our SOC sees behind this particular context, XIM helps our SOC to see, you know, bring those down, those, those 36 billion down, uh, events down into seven incidents. So seven incidents typically comprise of 133 alerts in a single day. Uh, most of those uh, alerts and incidents are completely automated, right? We only require just a few uh, incidents that need analyst overseers, right? So our mean time to response post XIM has been, you know, just one minute. Mean time to detect, 10 seconds. That is what we, we have been able to bring as part of this platform. Uh, the big differentiator is, yes, sir? Uh, mean time to resolve would be based on, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, workflows, right? Uh, depending on the incident, we can help share that mean time to resolve as well. So if you can meet us at the booth, we'll, we'll be happy to have di deep dive into a conversation with you. Yeah. Uh, so let's quickly, you know, look at the the platform action. I've been talking about it, just sh shown certain proof, but then let, let's, let's look at how the platform looks like. So for the SOC manager, what would the SOC manager really want to look at, right? Uh, for the SOC manager, XIM provides an overview of what are the type of incidents that are being seen, right? What What is the total incident level? Uh, how many have been automatically resolved, right? And what, what is the uh, number of alerts that have been stitched to an incident? This is very useful in, in terms of un understanding, you know, what is the level of consolidation or data stitching that, that is possible based on the incident and what can be used to further improve the particular platform, right? Uh, maybe there could be additional data sources that we have untapped. Maybe, maybe there could be better use of data sources for particular incident types that we have yet to integrate with that, right? Uh, it also shows, for example, uh, the as part of the incident chart, how many have been have required in, uh, analyst intervention? Uh, how many incidents have an automated action waiting for uh, analyst response? Right. So, a quick breakout of, of that particular uh, piece. The second piece is what is the mean time to respond based on automated incidents, based on analyst inc uh, analyst driven incidents? Using that, we can further enhance the workflows. We can further uh, improve the workflows that are needed as part of the platform. The second piece is uh, it helps understand across the timeline what is the level of severity that analysts are ha uh, handling compared to the, the severity of the incident that that is being automated. You would ideally want to have people in your SOC handling, you know, higher severity incidents. Lower severity should be completely automated. That is the goal that we want to look at. We want to have the analysts spend more quality time handling critical incidents, right? So this helps. This chart really helps to understand. Where is the analyst really spending time on, right? Is there something that we are doing wrong as part of the process? Uh, we, we will also look at some incidents from an analyst perspective as well. So this is the analyst overview. As part of the, uh, the analyst workflow, the analyst sees an incident. Incident is nothing but alerts composed from different data sources, right? Now, we have something, we have called the smart score. This is the, uh, the incident prioritization that I was talking about. It, basically com consolidates all of that together across different data sources and brings out that. The second piece is MITRE ATT&CK, right? Uh, we profile that particular incident across these data sources through the MITRE ATT&CK framework and help the analyst quickly understand what are the level of operations that the, the attacker has performed through that complete incident, right? What are the critical areas that need to be looked at? Uh, you can see the number of medium, high uh, severity alerts that have been come in across sources. These are data sources and alert sources that are part of that particular incident itself, right? Uh, 
correlation rules, etc. Now, XIM integrates with multiple tools across your SOC. So you would probably see Active Directory, you will probably see a perimeter firewall, etc. as part of that particular incident. Uh, it's showing us that this particular incident has, you know, two playbooks that have been automatically handled. There's a large user FTP upload that is handled. There are a couple of playbooks that is waiting on the analyst that the analyst has to take some certain action depending on, uh, you know, the, the organization's workflow that, uh, requirement, right? And then the recommendations based on that particular incident that XIM is telling the analyst, and you, you should also look at adding these type of workflows as part of your response. The second piece is, you know, extracting all the indicators in a central place. You're getting these many alerts from different sources. You have network, you have endpoint, you have maybe, uh, you know, your application. They all are putting out different, different, uh, different IOCs. We collect that all of that together. This is the causality chain that is built based on uh, stitching of this data across, across these devices, right? So we can, we can see, for example, uh, uh, the whole walkthrough of this particular incident for the analyst. We can quickly visualize where exactly uh, an attacker performed an action, right? You can see the number of. Uh, feeds that we look at, network, it could be a network connection, it could be a file read, or maybe it could also be a process chain that has happened, right? And uh, XIM automatically adds context to an alert as well, right? For example, has this been registered previously? Is this, has this part of a, you know, an attacker threat campaign that we see globally across uh, 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 in the world as well? The final piece is really, let's, let's dive, deep dive into, into the playbook recommendations as well, right? So it sees a particular behavior, an attacker behavior, let's say in this particular case, script engine activity. What XIM will tell is, you know, this is an additional playbook that I will recommend because I'm seeing this behavior as part of this incident, right? It is not part of your normal workflow, but you can choose to run it. It tells the analyst, you know, this is why I'm recommending it. Uh, the analyst can view the work, work plan as part of that particular action, right? Maybe, for example, uh, what is the behavior being observed on? Has it been observed on other different, uh, you know, data sources as well? And based on that, do you want to drive a containment action or do you want to drive, uh, you know, a deeper uh, trend around it? Now, uh, this continuously profiles analyst behavior as well. So if I'm an analyst, I choose to run this particular playbook on this incident. And next time there's an incident, it will uh, prompt the analyst saying that, you know, the last time this incident was seen, this particular playbook was run. So do you want to run it again? And over time, it learns that, it learns through a network effect that, you know, this is, this is a common playbook that is run across this incident type. So uh, it can bring that workflow into a typical automated steps as well. Now let's look at, uh, you know, the last one. So you might be saying, you know, we have been talking automation, automation. Why am I still seeing analyst driving actions? Why am I still seeing, you know, the analyst is still, you know, performing some of these actions, right? So this is where we can, uh, you know, uh, XIM can be completely automated as well. So we can have complete incident automation on, on few actions. So this is a particular incident where we are seeing, for example, multiple logins, right? Multiple logins from various sources. These are users that are being seen in that particular incident that, have, that, that we are seeing, you know, um, brute force based logins uh, from your data source. Now, you can see here that the playbook is already run. All of the automation is completed. Uh, now, this could be, you know, for example, validating where is this user typically logging in from? Are we seeing an unusual activity from this particular user uh, bringing in the, uh, the identity analytics? We can also understand, for example, what uh, source is the user logging in from, right? Is this, is this a typical laptop? Is it suddenly logging in from VPN and, uh, or trying to log in from VPN? Those kind of, that kind of context as well, right? So you can validate, you know, is this a really a valid account within that particular environment that they are trying to, has this, has this previously logged on successfully before? So uh, that uh, multi, uh, context that can be driven out as well. Uh, uh, you'll see the, from from an analyst perspective, right, you can validate what is the work that is being done automatically by the tool, right, going into the context, validating whether there was a recent change in password, et cetera. So you can see here, for example, is logging in from an IP address that is already marked as malicious. So probably there has been, uh, uh, you know, user credential theft, and uh, that is that is really brought in, you know, the context of why this is a severity incident. These are actions that an analyst would typically perform as part of the incident flow, automated, you know, you, you don't want the analyst to perform repetitive work for every uh, these, of these, uh, these kind of alerts. So completely automated in this particular case, they can just look at the post action and then, and then decide whether, you know, this, this, is, this has performed in line with the expectation, right? So this is, this is the entire work plan. You can see here, you know, uh, the, the work plan is completed, all of the steps that it has followed, all of the decision tree making. So 
uh, he can identify and perform proof of work that what, what automated actions have been done, have they been done incorrectly in line with the expectations of the work plan. Yes. So, sir, for example, you know, my identity has been stolen. I am a user. My identity has been stolen, right? And then, as part of the automated workflow, my ID got disabled as well, right? We can we can basically trigger, you know, as part of your workflow, you can have, uh, you know, a, a, an incident kind of uh, sending out an email or maybe a notification to the user out of band saying that, you know, because of this reason, your ID has gotten deactivated or disabled. Uh, you can go ahead and reset that password as part of your organization's process or reach out to the SOC team. We we can have that workflow added as part of the incident triage as well. You, have to, you may have to revert it, so do you have a ratio of that, yeah, how many times it ran, but it was actually a false positive, it was not really uh, a proper incident, or whatever comes here is already true incident. How, how does it work? Just want to understand. Yeah, that. sure. I think, I think you very b b bring up a very crucial point, sir, right? Uh, for us, what, what we have done is, you know, if you look at the amount of data that we collect, right, uh, that allows us to have a larger variety to run our data models on run our uh, and derive our AI models of from, right? Because of that, uh, we have, uh, uh, I would say, you know, a better score when it comes to understanding whether, whether it's a true positive, right? Uh, if you look at the amount of data that we collect, the amount of incident that we collect, we are one of the largest uh, collectors of uh, incidents, we are the largest collectors of objects across the globe, right? Uh, e including some, some open bodies as well. Right, we collect the largest amount of IOCs, we collect the largest amount of behaviors around that. So mm -hmm. we, we are very accurate when it comes to, you know, understanding whether that particular incident has, uh, has malicious context. Uh, that is the reason why we actually added explainability as part of the AI, uh, which, me, which tells the analyst, you know, I am saying that this is bad, but this is the reason why it is bad. There's always going to be a human context to any incident uh, response where the, the analyst wants to validate whether that particular system has taken the right call or not, right? Uh, and a lot of times that is that is hidden behind, uh, you would say, you know, UI or it is, it's hidden, hidden behind obscure logic. We try to make that easier for the analyst to validate. Uh, explainability, very big role that tells that this is why the, the, the incident has been ranked such in such a way. The other piece is around what is the exact work plan that was executed by the system as well. Because using that work plan, they can understand, okay, this, these are the actions that the system took, right? What is the right action? They can, they can also validate that, right? So we, this, is, uh, this is part of our, uh, you know, uh, the reason why we introduced that is so that it makes the response piece transparent to the, to the analyst itself. Okay, so let me paraphrase what I understood. So the models themselves are very accurate because you have, dirt, I mean, you have run it through a variety of incidents that have been collected over the world, number one. Even if uh, the, there's a false positive, there's a complete explainability provided to the guy who's looking at it and he can take a, a rollback okay. action or whatever needs yes. to be done for that. That is essentially yes. the strategy. Yes. Do you have any uh, percentage uh, of false positive to true positive? Any, any accuracy or recall number? Yeah, I think so. We can take that particular piece offline. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So we so can have, we can connect at the booth <laughs> and we can, we can deep dive on that particular piece. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So SOX with XIM, the whole reason of introducing XIM was making SOX go from a reactive mode that is hunting behind incidents, hunting behind, you know, new new disclosures, new vulnerability disclosures, et cetera, to be much more proactive in nature, right? That they are, they focus on the, uh, the threat hunting aspect, they focus on the incidents that require their attention compared to, you know, typical uh, run of the mill uh, outcome, right? So with XIM, we have seen that SOX have better incident outcomes, better response times, uh, and there's also reduced overhead because they don't, they're not spending time around, you know, making repetitive tasks or, uh, or performing tasks that are, that are, uh, that, that can be re easily handled by automation, right? Uh, but, you know, you would 
should ask me and you know Vishal raised a very important point that you know it all depends on where we are in, a, in our SOC journey, right? What are the ty type of uh, outcomes that we want to achieve, right? Uh, we are not saying that you have to just go and rip and replace everything that you need, right? We are part of your journey. We want to be part of your journey wherever you are or wh wherever you are at this particular stage, right? So uh, you can have from Palo Alto networks, you can look at, you know, I, I, if I want to just enhance my detection response piece, right? Uh, maybe we are not having the right tooling. We want to bring into multiple data sources together. You can start off with XDR itself, right? It helps you uh, bring bring together multiple data points, increase the detection and response piece of your SOC. Uh, uh, you say, you know, we probably have that better, but you want to add automation onto my SOC, right? We can start off the journey from there or look at, you know, understanding unknown assets within the, the environment and bring that together as well. Or you say, you know, I want to completely flip the script. I want to re-engineer my SOC to be automation first, re-engineer my SOC to be air-driven first. That's where XIM can, can really help uh, for, for you. So with that, I think I'll open it for questions. Uh, meanwhile, while you are answering questions, I'd request you to, you know, just scan the QR code and provide a session feedback. Uh, you can also engage us at the, at the booth as well. I'd also like to invite Tari Ansari as well uh, to take the stage so that uh, you know, we can, we can jointly answer. Yes, sir. So, uh, with this SDR technology, uh, the SIM will become redundant uh, down the line. Uh, is that the conclusion we can draw from this? Uh, so, if, if you look at, sir, right, the evolution of these technologies, uh, they were trying to solve different problems, right? Uh, SIM, for example, was looking at uh, aggregating logs from different sources and trying to, you know, correlate that together to make sense to the admin. Uh, but what has what has happened over time is that you know that that logging is not really enough for the SOC, right? It is typically like like I said, it's secondhand data that is coming in from a third party source for the for the SOC. They need better visibility. They need uh, much more richer data context and telemetry. That is really where XDR kind of evolved. Uh, supercharging detection response for the SOC, col collecting data from either network, from the endpoint, etc. Uh, there is definitely you know what is what is really happening is that there is there is a convergence happening. We are seeing, uh, you know, the, these kind of tools coming together. Uh, what we see is XIM basically bridging that whole gap together, right? Bringing XDR, bringing log management, bringing, uh, bringing uh, automation on as part of it together as, as a single platform. So that is where the industry is really heading towards. Well, that means you don't foresee SIM and XDR coexisting together because there will be a lot of overlap in their capability. O over time, yes. There are certain use cases that SIM does today around risk and compliance, right? But over time, what is what is what would really happen is that th those would get subsurged into the detection response piece as well, right? Today, XDR is primarily focused on detection response for the SOC, that is threat hunting uh, uh, or you know threat detection. But over time, this is this is really what we envision would happen. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sir. Uh, we use various models within our within our SOC. We have, uh, uh, I, I think, we we can have a further deep dive if you if you can reach us at the booth and we can we can have you know what exact models that we use uh, in the, within the tool. Hi, uh, I'm Aru. All right. So the question is more on the technical side. The tool seems to be very uh, interesting. Just wanted to know if it also can do this this assessment on an offline mode. Sorry. Not being connected on the network, provided the telemetry data like a bunch of data for, say, for example, for 15 days or so. Is it capable to do the assessment on that offline data and provide us the, the indicators? Yeah, so w one of the things that I, that I didn't touch in the interest of time is that there's a forensics model built in inside XIM, right? So if, for example, in, in such cases where you don't want to connect that particular uh, you know, device or something in, inside the network, we can collect offline forensics, import that data, and that data is actionable for the SOC, right? So the forensics that is collected could be, you know, uh, browser history, uh, logins, accesses that, that that particular user is. So that that can then build the the analyst can then then build context from uh, the data that is collected. Thank you. Just one last one, a real quick yeah. one. How does it learn the previous experience? Does it have a specific format for that data to be uploaded on that? Yes. So we will have a collector that uh, you will use to collect the forensic from the particular device, and then that can be uh, brought in into the platform. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. and uh, date, etc. I mean, sir? it is not related to a particular transition, banking transition. Uh, it is related to the network 
data you have taken for this? So, so we collect data from various sources. We have, we can have identity data where the user authenticates. We okay. can have data on the network sources. We can have data where, where, for example, the the session uh, ends, right? Uh, we could also collect data from the the server where the transaction is ending. So. Uh, across the data, entire data path, what is what is happening across, right? So, for example, the network might just see an exploitation that is happening, or it might miss it if it's a zero-day exploitation, right? Uh, that's where the the endpoint or the the server endpoint really comes into picture, where we see, you know, for example, actions taken on the OS, or you know, where where the attack is trying to branch out from the application and try to inject persistence onto that system. So that's that's what we see. Okay, I belongs to one educational institute. I am doing the research on this one. So, will you provide me the data for my the research? Sure, sir. We, we can definitely connect. So uh, we are available at the booth. We'll help you connect with our experts uh, from our engineering team, and that they can okay. really help you. you with thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. I think then what we can do is uh, I'll hand it off to Tariq. We'll have a Kahoot quiz. Tariq will walk you through the rules. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Ashish, uh, for the wonderful session. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the session here. Uh, what we are going to do is just to take the excitement on the next level. What we have done is we have designed a small quiz, uh, you know, for everyone to participate. And at the same time, you know, we will have a small award and, you know, token of appreciation from our side for your participation. This is going to be a uh, Kahoot quiz, KBC style quiz. And I would request every one of you to take out your mobile, you know, just contrary to any other session. So we will be using your mobile uh, for you to participate in this specific quiz. Uh, just go to, just open your browser and connect to kahoot.it. And once you are there on that page, just provide the game pin. Yeah. So let's wait for everyone to connect to kahoot.it. And then we will give you the game pin. Kahoot.it. So just feed in this uh, game pin and you will be part of the game. Just give a name, uh, you know, an easy name where we can identify you and it will be easy to hand over the gift and the awards. I can see people are joining in. I see some 60 people. So I would request everyone to be participating in this quiz. And don't worry, you know, the, the questions, whatever we have put in the quiz, uh, Ashish has already covered. We have made it really easy. Sorry? Player limit reach? Oh, I think we have hit some issue. Uh, would request, you know, if you can come to our booth, which is just outside, and then, you know, we'll be happy to have the quiz. Uh, at the booth, we have our experts available to have a deeper conversation around the topic which is discussed and, you know, showcased here. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, the network security experts and the XM experts and the XDR experts at our booth to help you discuss anything uh, around security topics which you might be experiencing in your organization or any other project, you know, which you are covering it at your organization, right? Uh, with that, we can we can close this session. Thank you very much for your participation. Appreciate it. Thank you.